Radio Richard. Hi, everybody. My name is Martin Turnbull, and I'm here today talking to Richard Niles about the re release of his stepdad's memoir called Whatever Happened to Hollywood. So, hi, Richard. How are you doing? Great to be here. Thank you. Good to speak to you. Um, before we start, perhaps we should both introduce ourselves. My name, as I said, is Martin Turnbull, and I am the author of a series of novels set at the real-life Garden of Allah Hotel that operated from 1927 to 1959. And those are the golden years of Hollywood, at least in my view. It's opened just before the release of The Jazz Singer, which introduced the talkies into Hollywood. And it closed in 59, which was sort of the dawning, the, the fading years of Hollywood's golden era. So I've written a series of nine books set in and around the Garden of Allah, telling the, the evolution of the golden years of Hollywood. So I have, I have written and researched a lot about this era. And so I was very pleased to get an advanced copy of this memoir that's, that'll be coming out soon. So Richard, tell us a bit about you and this book. Well, I've been a composer, arranger, uh, record producer pretty much all of my life. Um, I'm very lucky to have had two fathers to influence me greatly. My actual father was Tony Romano, who was a great musician, singer, guitar player, spent the war years playing with Bob Hope, the very first USO troop that toured during World War II. Wow. But before that, he had been a child star and, and Broadway uh, arranger for people like Cole Porter. So I had a great musical influence from him. And then my mother remarried somewhere around 1960 to Jesse Lasky Jr., who was an incredible playwright, poet, and, of course, screenwriter who wrote about 40 films, eight of them for Cecil B. DeMille. Um, his father actually produced the very first full-length motion picture in Hollywood, and his director was a first-time director who he had chosen because he really liked the guy. That was Cecil B. DeMille, a Sam Goldfish, who would later change his name to Goldwyn and become one of the great moguls himself. And so I was brought up with this fantastic background. And from Jesse Jr., I got an incredible education in writing, in literature, in film. So I was very lucky to have both of those, those influences. And of course, that influence affected my songwriting. Uh, I'm also an author. I've written eight books on music that I published. And uh, I couldn't be happier with the good fortune that gave me those people. Yeah. That brings us to this book, um, which I'm so glad that you've had a chance to read. Oh, what a uh, wonderful read it is too. The, the way that it came about really was that myself and my mother and, and all, of, all of his friends were entranced by hearing him tell these amazing stories of growing up at the very beginning of Hollywood all the way through to its golden age and its slight decline, shall we say, in the late 50s. And so we, we kept saying to him, wow, these stories are so great, you should write them down. And of course, finally, we nagged him enough that he sat down and started doing it. Well, thank, thank goodness you did too, because there are, there are quite some stories. So now you're sitting about republishing it. Can you give us an idea of what, what, what circumstances led to that? Well, for many years, I've just been very unhappy that such a great book had gone out of print, and also the publishers who had published the original edition, Funk and Wagnalls, went out of business. So I thought, well, let's do it, because it really deserves it. Then I decided, well, you know, one of the great things that would bring it to life for people would be this amazing archive of photos that we have, both the personal private family photos and also a good friend of the family, Mark Wanamaker of the Bison Archive. And I, I don't know if you know him, but you ought to. I know of him. I don't think we've actually met, but I certainly know of him because well, he's <laughs> he's quite quite the guy. Yeah, and you guys would get on like a house on, on fire. And, and especially since you have such brilliant, wonderful photos on your 
on your website. Uh, you know, that's the thing that that introduced me to you really was that I came across your website and I thought, wow, this is fantastic. What fun for a film buff to see these photos. And, and it's not only just about film specifically, but it's about LA and Hollywood and the physical layout of the city and, and how people lived and worked there. And I think that's also fascinating that you do, that you, you put the people that we know of as the stars and the directors and the actors and all that, but you put it into the context of where they lived and how they got around and the streetcars they took and the buses and the taxis. And it, I, for me, it was just a joy. And so that's why I originally got in touch with you. Well, that, that, I think those um, photos that I post, and just for people who are watching this, I post a vintage photograph of LA um, every day. And I, I do a bit of research and do a bit of digging and try to get explain as, as efficiently as I can the context of the photograph, because the, the era that I write about, which is the same era that, that this, this memoir is, yes. um, I think it helps to have context about what traffic was like along Hollywood Boulevard. Absolutely. And, I think and that's what, great. Did, what, did, what did the Egyptian theater look like and how, what was it like to catch a streetcar along along uh, out of out of downtown and, and it just brings these legendary stories that we have uh, I think to life Absolutely. so we can, so we can we can better understand what life was really like versus the the life that was depicted on screen during this era because it was a very stylized idealized version of life and that's that's just interesting in its own respect but there's also meanwhile there's reality and yeah. that's what I like about about these Yes, and I've always, a lot of people have said to me throughout the years, well, you know, why analyze anything? Why not just enjoy it? And to me, that's just silly because you enjoy it a lot more knowing the background of it. If you know where a, where a certain uh, scene in a film was actually filmed and how they technically put it together and, and the fact that all of these famous Hollywood people happen to be the extras in Ben Hur. You know, you, it brings that that whole scene to life more uh, <laughs> than than just watching the film a, as a sort of a dumb viewer and then going out and having a pizza. It gives you, uh, right. yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. So um, let's. I want to start with Cecil B. DeMille because. Um, that's where kind of the whole Lasky family started, as you said. They uh, they came out um, to film Squawman, which was uh, really the start of Hollywood filmmaking. Uh, and this is Jesse Lasky Senior, yes, uh, who who established famous players Lasky, which evolved into Paramount. So the Lasky family were really there right from the very start. What struck me about when reading this book is that. His, his professional life, at least, um, seemed to reflect that old adage that you're only as good as your last picture. And he had to prove himself over and over again. He didn't seem to get any credit for well, being a forefather. Jesse Lasky Sr. had started as a very successful vaudeville and Broadway producer. He had uh, shows going all over the country in New York. He was born unlike any of the moguls, he was born in California. He was born in San Francisco. Ah. Uh, his family had come over in the covered wagon, uh, his mother and his father. So he was a, he was a second generation Californian oh. and, and Jesse Jr. of course was a third generation Californian. You, you didn't find very many of those in those days. He got together with his brother-in-law, Sam Goldfish, told him about the flickers, which was an amazing thing that he said, you've got to see this. You're going to love this form of entertainment. The flickers go for it. And, and Jesse saw it uh, and, and thought, yes, yes, this could be something, but it has to, it's no good just having these little short uh, snippets of film. We've got to make a, a real story, a real play. And that's why he called his, his company the Jesse Lasky Feature Play Company because for, for him, the play, the writing, the story was everything. He said he, he thought that 
that was how you hooked an audience with an incredible, compelling story. Um, later on, of course, the uh, other companies realized, well, actually the audience loves stars and they want to see stars. Yeah. Well, so he, he decided to make his first film and they bought a very successful Broadway play, The Squaw Man. And uh, originally Lasky had wanted to hire William DeMille, who was a very successful Broadway director and writer, but William DeMille wasn't available because he was so busy and also he didn't want to waste his time on this newfangled nonsense, uh, uh, the flickers. But his mother was his agent and she said to Lasky, well, oh, he's not available, but, I, but I've got another son, Cecil. He's so talented. He's a genius. Please meet with him. Well, Jesse met with Cecil and Cecil had never directed anything, but Lasky liked him. He just saw in him that same enthusiasm and magical feeling about creation and, and putting on a show because Lasky had been a showman since the very beginning. Right. Uh, and so, so he said, okay, I'm going to give this kid a chance. And, and of course, he sent him out to Hollywood with a very experienced cameraman, Oscar Opfel, uh, so that so that he wouldn't go too far wrong. And he hired Dustin Farnham, who was a star of the stage, to be in it. And it was a successful play already, The Squaw Man. So he thought, well, I'm on to a good thing. And uh, then, of course, DeMille and Oscar Affle and, and Dustin Farnham took the train west, and they were originally booked to filmed the entire thing in Flagstaff, Arizona. But unfortunately, when the train arrived in Flagstaff, Arizona, they said, sorry, you can't get off because there's a, there's everybody shooting everybody. There's a cattle war going on here. You'll have to stay on the train. And so DeMille said, well, wh what's the next stop? Well, he said, well, it's, it's, it stops uh, near Los Angeles uh, in a place called Hollywood. That's the first stop. So they got off at Hollywood and uh, they rented a barn. And so he sent the famous telegram back to Lasky saying, Flagstaff, no good for our purposes, want authorization to hire a barn here in Hollywood. And, and uh, Lasky sent back the famous telegram saying, authorization approved, but make no long-term commitments. <laughs> so that's how Hollywood was born. And uh, throughout Lasky's life, he was a dreamer, he was a, a mystic, he was a, uh, an enthusiastic promoter of everything. He believed in, in the show, he believed in the story, he believed in, in entrancing the audience with these exciting stories. And uh, of course, that quality endeared him to all the people who wanted to get things done because he was, he was so inspiring. But at the same time, Lasky Sr. was not a good businessman at all in any way, shape, or form. So as a result, you know, he just trusted everyone. Um, there's, there's something in the book where, where um, I believe it was uh, Adolf Zucker who said, yes, Jesse's a very, very nice man, but he's too nice. He's just too nice. And, and that's really the, the, where his downfall was. He trusted everyone. And finally, when the, when the stock market crashed, he had put all of his money into Paramount stock. Now, the, uh, other, the other film moguls did not. They diversified their portfolio. They had money in various different surefire kind of things. And, and they, they didn't lose too much. But Lasky, who believed in his company and believed in filmmaking, lost everything. And he had been one of the richest men in the world and was brought down to literally being thrown out of his house and nothing. And so- It, it, it seemed that, that after that, he kind of scrambled to regain any sort of stature in correct. the industry and never really quite got there. Correct. And, and if, if, if it had not, been for the one person in Hollywood 
who stood by him and was his friend, which was Jack Warner. Everyone else turned their back. DeMille, Goldwyn, all of them. I mean, these were people whose careers Lasky had started. Right. He brought right. he brought Goldwyn into the business. Goldwyn was a was a glove salesman. Yeah. And yeah. and he brought him in because he brought in the finance. But 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 you know, it was Lasky's brilliance that created the industry as it became. Demille would not have had a chance in hell. He would have been scrambling for the rest of his life if if Lasky had not given him the opportunity to direct the Squaw Man. And of course, the Squaw Man was successful and they started right away making more and more films. And, and of course, no one's saying that DeMille wasn't talented. He right. was phenomenally talented. But, but you know, when it came down to it, uh, when Lasky needed help, the only person who gave it to him and the only person who believed in him was Jack Warner. And so, yes, he struggled for the rest of his life, but, but how many film producers can say that they produced a thousand films? Because that's what Jesse Lasky Sr. produced. Your stepfather, who was Jesse Lasky Jr., Indeed. witnessed and absorbed all of those lessons. And so it's kind of ironic that he should end up working for DeMille. Mm. And uh, I've researched uh, DeMille, DeMille a little bit because he's a character in one of my novels, The, the Heart of the Lion, which is about Irving Thalberg. Indeed. And what what I I and the insight that I got from this book of yours is that at least when it came to his writers, and I assume everybody else, but um, we're seeing it from the respect of a writer because Jesse Lasky Jr. was a, a writer, was he was he was ruthless. And yeah. he he ruled by completely by fear and intimidation and almost scaring the story out of his writers. And it seemed that DeMille's rationalization for that was the end justifies the mean. So and this yeah. is how he gets the best, fullest, most cinematic story. So it seemed to me that he put his writers through absolute hell. And I was wondering what Jesse Jr spoke about that to you was that a, an overall positive experience or was it because he was working with the a-list director of hollywood he put up with this treatment that that wouldn't be put up with these days well there are two reasons and two and two very good reasons number one jesse jr had grown up in an incredible mansion two mansions with five or six rolls royces 12 servants one wow. beach house, one beach house on, on uh, at Santa Monica, and another another uh, mansion at Saltaire. He grew up with this thing, and he went away to the University of Dijon for for university. Oh wow! Within about a year, he was called back because his father was completely bankrupt, and they couldn't afford to keep him there. And he came back and suddenly he had to hit the streets to yeah. try to get some kind of a job as, as his father was hitting the streets to try to get some kind of a job. Right. Um, and so having experienced that, I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, I grew up in poverty, so I'm very careful about my money. Well, with, with Jesse Jr., he was he grew up in in incredible wealth and then lost it all and and the contrast was something that he did not want to suffer again and so he began uh as a as a lowly reader for saul wurzel uh, which was a very low paid job but it was a job, a that job. He, yeah. you know and then and then he uh Eventually, he got together with a, a novelist who wrote potboiler novels, really just quickie things that sold and got him in advance, and then he'd write another one. And so when he finally got the chance to work for DeMille, DeMille took him on. And once Jesse was in that DeMille company, suddenly he was being really well paid. Oh. I mean, 
for a writer, of course, writers didn't get anywhere near the kind of money that everyone else on the film was making, but the writers made good money. And not only that, he in some ways realized that DeMille's judgment for DeMille films was absolutely gold. And, and so Jesse it was a tremendously sophisticated erudite, uh, I mean, you could, there was nobody in the world you could ever have a conversation with that was more fascinating, that was more interesting and constantly making you realize new things about life and what had gone before and, and look at today in a different way. And, and so it wasn't that he had the same uh, uh, tastes as DeMille, but he understood that a job is a job. You know, I've worked a lot of my life as a musical arranger and I've worked for other people. And so if somebody calls me up and says, I want this song to sound like X, well, that's my job that I can, I know how to make it sound like X and I will do that. And so that's what Jesse really thought. You know, he said, the boss is the boss. Do try to figure out what he wants and then try to give that to him. And many times to get from that A to, to the Z of being able to uh, satisfy DeMille was torture. I mean, there's, there's one uh, story that Jesse tells in the book about DeMille looking at a scene that he's written for the Ten Commandments and DeMille is so insulting and so absolutely heartless and cruel that he spits on the script, at which point Jesse said, right, that's it, I'm leaving. And he went into his office and he, he packed his, his things. He was putting away all, all of his books. And then eventually DeMille walks in on him and says, uh, well, you know, if you look in your Bible, you will see. If you look in your Bible, Jesse, you know, because and and I I use that voice because that's the voice that it's it's not really authentic to Mill, but it's it's kind of the way Jesse did to Mill. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I mean it's exaggerated, of course, like all great performances are an exaggeration. If you look in your Bible, Jesse, you will see that it says. And God took uh, the dust of the earth and mixed it with spittle and made man, you know. And, and so that convinces Jesse to go back to work and, and continue to work on the script. Uh, and of course, later on, he said, uh, Mr. DeMille, where is it? I couldn't find, I can't find it in the Bible. Where is that? And, and DeMille just said, well, if you keep looking, keep looking, Jesse, look hard. Of course, it wasn't there. He'd made it up. Right, right. So, you know, it's a combination of the fact that he trusted DeMille to make a DeMille picture. And he also loved the fact of having a steady job on salary, not just working, you know, job to job, but you're on salary for a long period of time. Yeah, and there's there's a lot to be said for that. And, and I... Uh... I wondered how I would react under the same circumstances, which is difficult because I'm looking at it from a 21st century perspective, and this was the you other know, 1930s, 40s, and 50s. But at the very least, I would imagine that Jesse Jr. knew of uh, DeMille's track record and that he hit far more times than he missed. And if this is DeMille's process to get to a fantastic movie, then that's that's part and parcel of, of, of the, the process. And, and I can't imagine that the, the cameraman or the extras or the actors probably had it any easier. It was just, this is the way we make a, Correct. a great movie. And he did make great movies. So there's something to that. That's it. And, and also, uh, of course, in fact, I don't think he ever missed uh, <laughs> in terms of hitting and missing. But, but I also think that... Uh, Jesse had a respect for him, even though he knew that he was a tyrant, even though that he knew he was a misogynist, even though that he knew that he was cruel and heartless uh, to people. 
um, even though he, you know, all of those things, but he still had a respect for him for doing what he did. And so that's why he, he lasted out <clears throat> so long. Uh, he was part of the studio system. That was the studio system. It was, it was the studio system. Did did when when Jesse Jr. spoke to you about DeMille, was it with fondness or with look at what I had to put up with? Or how how was he how did he it speak? Was, to it you? was definitely a mix. Yeah. It was yeah. definitely a mix. Um there was definitely some affection there, but but there was also just an incredible uh, uh, amazement that he had put up with all that. But remember also though, <clears throat> it was somewhat somewhat uh, made easier by the fact that <clears throat> Jesse always wrote for DeMille as part of a team. And what in the book, Jesse says, well, a lot of people have asked me through the years, how can you write as part of a team? Well, you have to remember these, these stories, these kinds of epics <clears throat> that DeMille made were without question not personal stories from Jesse himself, nor were they ever assumed to be. They were meant to be, here is the drama we are presenting. This is the way I want to present that drama. How can we best do it? And so, as he says, one man would be chosen purely for their uh, historical acumen, for the accuracy of <clears throat> every single element of it had to be justified, especially when making a bi biblical film. Especially, uh, especially that especially that one. That was a big movie. Oh, yeah, the Ten Commandments. And well, there are a lot of them were big movies. Sure, Samson and Delilah yeah. was, was nothing to sniff at either. The other thing was that uh, you'd have a, a guy who's, who was purely construction. When Jesse wrote with my mother, you know, my mother was always very good at the construction. This should go here, this should go here. Here's the way the story should go. Jesse was always absolutely a genius with words. And, uh, you know, if you get the chance to read any of his poetry, it's absolutely mind blowing. Really? Um, and, and his verse plays, he did, he did a wonderful verse play called Ghost Town. Um, he wrote a wonderful verse, uh, long, long form verse poem called A Penny for the Guy. Uh, and and that you know this is, and and you can see it even in the in the three books of poetry that he published when he was sixteen and seventeen, it's just an amazing, uh, a, you could call it a genius for for words. And so, Jesse was always chosen for that, for his language, and for coming up with with lines that had had magic to them. I mean, uh, you know. Uh, there are just so many examples of it, but uh, the one line that he wrote for for Gary Cooper, which was just so apt, where Gary Cooper says to to the 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 heavy, the bad guy, he says, "You know, a feller shouldn't jump to conclusions. It's likely to be a feller's last jump." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Those kinds of things are great in a movie, and and that's what Jesse was often called to to come up with. And what what I think people don't realize is that, uh, but but Jesse Jr. would have realized because he grew up in in that in that time and place is that most movies were written by more than just the people who got the credit on the screen. Oh, absolutely, yes. It, it, so he would have known that um, he was a cog in the writing wheel, and that. And that reel was a cog in a larger machine and he knew his place. And, and from reading that book, it seemed to me that for all his faults um, and browbeating and insulting and belittling, because there was a lot of belittling. Yes. It seemed to me that when, when Jesse Jr. finally got the scene right in DeMille's eyes, DeMille recognized that. He said, and now we have it. Now that's the scene I was looking Correct. for. Maybe, yes. maybe DeMille didn't quite know exactly what, it, what that scene would be like until he read it. But when he read yes. it, he's yes. like, bingo, we've got it, That's, we'll nail it. Yeah, and I think, I think modern uh, script writers and modern filmmakers, modern directors will be very shocked to see that in those days, all the films that you saw from the 30s, 40s, even, even into the 50s, every single shot 
every camera angle, every costume, every movement of the actors was scripted. There was nothing left to chance. Right. Once in a while, someone would come up with something on the set. And once in a while, DeMille would say, no, we need to change that. Let's think of something else, which is why Jesse, especially more than the other writers, had to be on the set during a lot of the filming, just in case they needed a different line. Right. And today's directors, uh, you know, they want to improvise scenes. They want to let the actors uh, sort of come up with ideas themselves. Uh, they want to just uh, film in a much more what they call organic method. Well, you couldn't do that with the enormous semi-articulated lorry that was a motion picture company. It was just a, a production like, like uh, the Ten Commandments. You can't guess. Every single shot had been drawn, you know, uh, and, and storyboarded. Right. Um, and, and, and so it's a completely different world. Than, and, I'm, and I'm glad that this book can introduce that world to, to the modern uh, reader and uh, the modern filmmaker. And perhaps they may find that there are some elements of that world which are uh, perhaps worth saving. Yeah, and I, th I think it shows in the finished product. The reason why I enjoy movies from the 30s, 40s, and 50s is that they were much more carefully crafted. The, 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 the lighting and, and the, the, the shading and the cinematography and the costumes and the direction were all, were all very carefully designed for a specific purpose and toward a, a, a specific goal. And when you look at, if you look at, um, say, Casablanca or Now Voyager, ju just, just, there's a scene I love in Now Voyager where Betty Davis, who's been playing a frump, has turned into a, a glamour puss, and she just lifts that wide brim hat, and you see her for the first time having been made over. And just, just the lift of a hat was probably very, very carefully choreographed with the lighting. Very. And the costuming with the hat and the makeup and the lighting for her and it it's just this gorgeously um captured moment that when I, I'm, I'm still talking about it 75 years later that's right yes you you don't well you certainly don't find that in the movies of the 60s and 70s where it it that that skill that that high operating skill level was, was lost. I mean, some of these people retired and died and died out, but also the studio system had died out and what replaced him yes. may have well, been a looser free way of doing it, but the end product for me is a much more masterfully um, crafted motion picture. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and in fact, Betty Davis famously said, and I think this is a tremendously helpful quote to explain what we're talking about, she said, actors have to be larger than life. Scripts have to be larger than life. Movies must be larger than life. Now, it's a complete difference of, of, of intent. If you want to make a movie, which they used to call kitchen sink movies, uh, about uh, a guy who's sitting in the corner picking his nose uh, in a dirty t-shirt and he walks over and grabs a beer and says, uh, you know, hey, Doris, get in here. And, you know, what? that's fine if that's the kind of movie you want to see. But DeMille and those filmmakers of those times did not find that entertaining. They wanted as many bums on seats as possible. And they weren't necessarily, a lot of people say, well, yeah, they're just playing to the common denominator. No, they were providing uplifting, magical, larger than life moments, not life, but larger than life. Later, I think in the 60s and the 50s and 60s, the, the film should reflect the spirit of the times. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's fair enough. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But nevertheless, look at what's happened. Look at the most successful films of today and for the last 10 years or more. What are they? The blockbuster Star Wars and, and et cetera, the Marvel films, the, all the superhero stuff. It's larger than life. And don't tell me that those films are, uh, you know, uh, and improvised on the set. No, they're complicated, very sophisticated, very expensive productions. And once again, it doesn't cost as much to make uh, a film that is a slice of life as it costs. I mean, Breathless is a great movie, but it didn't cost what Samson and Delilah cost, or indeed what you know, Spider-Man cost. They don't cost that much because there doesn't have to be that much preparation. That doesn't have to spend that much money on the cinematography, on the processes, you know, the, all, of the, all of the things. So that's why the world is different. But it's, in my opinion, it's gone right back to DeMille in terms of all these blockbuster films that are so successful today. My, my, my thought about that has been with slice of life movies is fine, but we, we can have a slice of life just living our life. But the big spectacle movies <clears throat> is an aspect of life that we'll never experience. And big movies on big screens, uh, that's kind of where they belong. Um, Correct. With, with, with all the, the mastery of the cinematic arts you can throw at it is, is fine by me. Exactly. And, yeah. and of course, how wonderful to have spectacle. You know, that's, we love spectacle. Why? Because it takes us away from thinking about paying our bills, about the fact that we've got to have dinner tonight and we haven't even thought about it and we're sitting alone in our room and, oh, I guess I can have beans on toast. You don't want to see a movie about beans on toast. At least I don't. No, we're living it. <laughs> yeah, we're living it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found most interesting is um, one of the movie stars that gets a lot of space in the book and that's Gene Harlow. Uh, when Jesse Jr. was fairly young, I'm, as I recall about 20, he had a brief affair with Gene Harlow and she's also a character in my Irving Thalberg book. Oh, great. She was a very real person and very <laughs> down to earth and she was kind of saw herself as one of one of the crew but she was also very sexually free and not not particularly inclined to toe the line in terms of back then, we're talking 20s and 30s. Uh, it struck me how, how lucky Jesse Jr. was to have an experience like that with somebody like that, especially right. when he was young and she was a few years older, as I recall. Not, not very much. She was probably about five or six years older. And, and Jesse got the opportunity to meet her because he had gone on a holiday with his father. And of course, his father was still Jesse Lasky, the man who had produced so many successful films. They were in Mexico, I believe, uh, uh, Agua Caliente. Right. And, and they were playing golf. And uh, they ran into the next people. And instead of pushing them out of the way, his father saw that it was Gene Harlow and said, oh, hi, Gene, you know, how are you doing? And meet my son. That chance meeting led to uh, a moment when Jean said to him, well, you know, they got on well on the golf course and she was a very fine golfer. Oh, and, was she? Well, yes, indeed. And she loved golf. It was, it was the thing oh, that she, sure. she loved going out. Yeah, uh, there's some pictures in the book of her, of her playing golf. And uh, she said, well, uh, okay, I'll tell you what, you know, you're a pretty good player, uh, Jesse. Why don't you call me? And, and we'll uh, play on when, whenever it was. I can't remember the date, but they, next Sunday, call me at so-and-so. And when Jesse got back to LA, of course, he was working as a lowly reader, probably the lowest kid on the totem pole uh, in Saul Wurzel's company. And he thought, uh, she must have just been being nice to me because of dad. Right. She, she didn't really want, expect me to call. And suddenly he's sitting in his office, his little shared office with six other guys, <laughs> and his phone rings. 
And she says, oh, you're going to stand an old lady up, are you? <laughs> and he said, oh, I, I didn't realize, I didn't think you were serious. I she said, well, I was serious. Get down, you know. So then they started meeting quite often. She, she, at the time, she was between boyfriends wanting to go out and have fun. You know, that's what she enjoyed doing. She loved going to clubs and she loved going out to dinner and dancing and and Jesse remember had been trained and brought up for the high life he knew it very well and he he was he was a great dancer uh he loved music he he uh, under he knew so much he could talk about the poetry and writing and and film and you know he was a great companion for her but in terms of maturity he was very, very inexperienced and and inexperienced with with girls, much less Jean Harlow, the sex goddess of the world. Yeah. Their relationship was never sexual because he never pushed it. And the one night when she pushed it, when she invites him to her bedroom, he doesn't take the hint. He just offers to read her poetry or, or when she says she has a headache and wants to go to bed, he doesn't say, okay, I'll get in with you. He does the polite gentlemanly thing. I mean, that's another thing that I, I have to say about Jesse is that he was almost a, I think it is a dead breed, the gentleman, right. um, you know, and I'm sure you and I try to keep it alive as much as we can, but he was honestly really like that. You know, he always used to say to me, let the other person have their space, listen to them. Don't just talk, listen, you know, right. and, and if you have an argument with somebody, don't, don't box them into a corner because then they'll lunge out at you like a, like a lion or a tiger. Right. So, so he was very, very, he understood the whole thing of, of having absolutely beautiful manners. And so as a result, you know, eventually Jean Harlow herself wanted, as we say in England, a little rumpy pumpy. Whereas, <laughs> whereas he was just not set up to do all that, you know. Right. And, uh, and she sends him home and then he never sees her again because William Powell comes back into her life. And it's a, also a very interesting thing that people will see in the book that when his boss, Saul Wurzel, finds out that he is dating Jean Harlow in the most shocking way possible, that he has a date with her, but Saul Wurzel is insisting that he view stock footage with him during the evening, she says, I don't mind waiting for you. I'll wait for you in your office because I've got to go over some scripts. She was very serious about her craft. A lot of people don't really know that, but she yeah. really cared about doing the best job she could. She was line perfect on everything. She never didn't know her lines. She knew everybody else's lines. And the other actors and the crews loved her because she was so relaxed and professional. And she never kept anybody waiting the way some other stars uh, have. And, and we, we, of course, we hear about Marilyn Monroe. She was hated by the crews because she just was a, a mess, but not Jean Harlow. And so she was studying her script up in Jesse's little tiny cramped office, which had six guys in it. Uh, and it's it's like one or two in the morning. And so Wurzel looks up at the at the the window and he says, Jesse, did you leave that that light on in there? What is what's going on with you? Didn't I tell you about turning lights off? And Jesse says, Oh well actually Mr. Wurzel, I, I have a young lady waiting for me. I had a date, but I, she, she, she said it would be okay if she waited in my office. So, ah, Junior's getting a little tonight, isn't he? Yeah, well, bring it. And of course, meanwhile, it was an empty studio and Jean Harlow heard this. And so she came walking down the stairs very slowly wearing the ultimate white satin gown cut to the navel and beyond. 
And uh, Saul Wurzel looked up in horror. But Jesse, it looks like uh, it can't be. It can't be. It, Mr. Wurzel, I'd like to introduce Miss Jean Harlow. And of course, that changed everything. Jesse was immediately taken from $25 a week salary to $250 a week salary. Now, in those days, that was an unbelievable amount of money. You could say that was, I mean, it's a minimum of 15 or 20 times that. Uh, and if, as soon as it was known that Jesse had broken up with Gene Harlow, bang, back to $25 a week, back to his tiny little office. Uh, that's Hollywood for you. <laughs> that is really Hollywood. So after, after Jesse Jr.'s um, Hollywood scriptwriting career kind of came to an end, he relocated to England. They got a phone call from a German producer, said he holding his fingers up and shaking them. And the producer said that he wanted to make two films in, in London and that he was raising finance for it. He wanted to do two films. One film was on the life of the Buddha and the other one was the life of uh, Lord Nelson. Of course, that was right down Jesse's alley, all of this stuff. And so they came to London with me and uh, were working on that. And when they had finished the first draft of the film, this producer had put them in a flat in Mayfair. They called up his hotel. He was staying at the Mayfair Hotel. He had said he wanted to talk to them about, it, about the next draft of the script and Whatever. Mm -hmm. They called his hotel to, to find out when the next meeting would be. And they said, oh, Mr. So-and-so isn't here. Uh, and they said, well, when will he be back? No, he's moved out of the hotel. Well, what do you mean he's moved out? Did he say where he was going? No, he just left for the airport this morning with Miss So-and-so, which, <laughs> which was his PA, who was a journalist. They said, well, that's crazy. It's ridiculous. Well, what he had done was he had raised $7 million. And he had taken that money in cash in a couple of suitcases and gone to South America. Oh. And he lived there for about eight years past the statute of limitations. Oh, right. Interpol was, was trying to get him the whole time, but they did, couldn't get a, extradition. I think he went to Brazil. Uh. And then years later, he showed up with now that money had been invested and it was now more like a hundred million dollars. Oh. Probably in, that was about 1970 by now. Oh, wow. and, and he became one of the most successful uh, producers in, in uh, New York, and his wife became an internationally uh, famous novelist. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I'm not mentioning the names just, just because it's still possible that they might possibly want to sue us for that. But in any case, this is a true story, and it shows you the kind of fly-by-night thing because they need the writer as Jesse explains in the book they need the writer in order to raise their finance without a script they've got nothing right. so now here's the script and it's by Jesse Lasky who's written the Ten Commandments and he's written Samson and Delilah they've got this fantastic thing and we're we need so that's where the money went and and so now my parents were stuck in London so they immediately had to change residence because they couldn't afford to live in North Audley Street anymore. Right. And uh, they said, well, okay, let's see what's going on here. And they got an agent and they, there was a lot of TV production going on there. They wrote The Saint, The Baron, loads of other things, The Avengers. Um, they wrote for Jerry Anderson. They wrote Space 1999. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and they wrote the protectors, the you know, the, the, the persuaders, all these different shows, and uh, they were very, very active and 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 cut out a career for themselves there. 
he died in England. So I assume they, they lived there for the rest of their lives. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. And, and they loved it. And remember that Jesse also had worked for a time in England for Alfred Hitchcock and had also worked for a number of other uh, British film companies uh, during the 30s. And he loved London. And of course, it fit in with his whole upbringing and his of course, understanding yeah. of culture. And of yeah. course, he loved the museums, you know, dinner yeah. parties. He loved the clubs. He loved the, the elegance. You know, so for him to move back to England was absolutely no pressure at all. He loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sounded like it suited him and he suited it. Just remind people watching the, the name of the book is Whatever, Happened, book to is Whatever <laughs> Happened to Hollywood. And it will be coming out July 19th, 2021. And, and this is the cover by my son. And this photograph on the front, by the way, was taken by Jesse's very good friend, Yul Brynner. And and uh, they were they were very close friends, and there's some nice uh, stories about that in the book. Yep. And this was a photo of Jesse later on when he was in London, uh, right. in our in our flat. We, then they had a flat in Green Street, also in Mayfair, and uh, and so that's when it's coming out. Great. So it's good. So it'd be available in paperback and ebook and is there an audio book version? And the audio book. I've actually just finished recording the audio book uh, oh, myself. Right. And uh, and if you can put up with my funny accents, uh, it's it's a hoot. <laughs> it's a hoot. The only thing you don't get with the audio book is the uh, all the great photographs. But on the other hand, think of it this way: you can get both of them. You can. You can. And the I, I will say that the the inclusion of those photographs, um, as we were talking about before, the context photos of vintage photos of LA, it, it, and there's a lot of them in this book, and they give great um, context to, to what and who and where you're reading about. And they sort of really, I found it really helps to uh, enhance the whole uh, experience of the book. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I hope so. That was always my intent, and I colorized them for that reason, so that I could bring it to life for the modern reader. And yeah. uh, I did my best in my own uh, way, <laughs> and and I hope everybody enjoys it. I'm, and I really look forward to hearing from people uh, when they've had a chance to read it, to, to hear their reactions. Yeah, that'd be great. So uh, thank you for your time. It's been great chatting with you, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to read an advanced copy of the book. Okay, well, thanks, Martin. And I, and I really, I mean, I'm, I'm only a quarter of the way through your book, but I'm really enjoying it. Of course, it's all stuff that I, I know about and, you, and you're bringing it to life beautifully. So uh, okay. I'm looking forward to reading that and your other stuff. Great, okay, uh, thanks a lot. Okay, Martin, thank you. Good night. Bye -bye.